Nightfall had draped its thick cloak over the dense woods bordering the old highway, a stretch of road notorious for its winding paths and harrowing legends. The locals spoke in hushed tones about the dangers of traveling this route after dusk, a rule stanchly obeyed by everyone, everyone except Alan Kendrick. Alan, a seasoned but reckless photojournalist, had scoffed at the small town superstitions. He was returning from an assignment in the north, his camera filled with shots of the hauntingly beautiful landscapes, his mind alight with the thrill of the wild. The warning to not drive alone at night on this particular highway had only fueled his curiosity, turning his drive into a challenge against the unseen. As he entered the infamous stretch, his car's headlights sliced through the fog that seemed to rise from the ground itself, like tendrils of smoke grasping at the light. The dense canopy above allowed only specks of moonlight to pierce through, casting eerie shadows across the road. Alan's grip on the steering wheel tightened as he sensed the weight of solitude pressing down on him, the only sounds being the car's engine and the occasional skitter of wildlife in the underbrush. Miles from the nearest town, his car's radio began to crackle, static distorting the music he'd been relying on to keep his mind alert. Annoyed, he smacked the dashboard, trying to clear the sound, but instead, the radio fell silent. He muttered a curse under his breath, feeling the first twinge of unease. It was then he noticed another sound, a soft whispering, like voices carried on the wind. He shook his head, attributing it to his imagination, spurred on by the isolation. As the night deepened, the whispers grew louder, clearer, as though a multitude of voices were speaking all at once, right outside his windows. Chills ran down his spine, his previous confidence evaporating into the cold night air. Rational thoughts battled with rising panic. The logical part of his mind insisted it was just the wind, but another, primal part, feared something far more sinister. Attempting to focus on the road, Alan's headlights suddenly illuminated a figure standing in the middle of the lane, a woman, dressed in a white gown that seemed to glow in the dim light. Her hair was long and wild, her face obscured by shadow. Instinctively slamming on the brakes, the car skidded on the loose gravel, coming to a jarring halt inches away from the woman. Heart pounding, he blinked, expecting her to vanish like a figment of his imagination, but she remained eerily still. Cautiously, Alan lowered the window, the air filled with the scent of wet earth and pine. Do you need help? He called out, his voice betraying a hint of fear. The woman moved then, her head tilting slightly, as if considering his offer. She stepped closer, her movements graceful yet unnervingly silent. As she reached the edge of the illuminated path cast by the headlights, her face came into view, and Alan gasped. It was not one face, but many, shifting and changing, features blending into one another, never settling on a single form. Frozen with horror, Alan's hand scrambled for the car door lock, but before he could secure it, the woman vanished, as if swept away by the wind. The whispers crescendoed then ceased abruptly, leaving a suffocating silence. He didn't remember starting the car or turning it around, all he knew was an overwhelming urge to flee. The drive back was a blur of adrenaline and fear, every shadow a hiding place for that spectral figure, every sound a potential whisper. When he finally reached the outskirts of a town, the first hints of dawn coloring the horizon, he didn't stop until he was surrounded by the comforting buzz of early morning activity. Safe in his own bed later that day, the sunlight seemed to wash away the terrors of the night. It was easy to laugh off the experience in the light of day, to attribute everything to an overactive imagination fueled by local myths. But as night approached once again, his bravado faded. The whispers returned, this time inside his home, reminding him of what he'd seen, or thought he'd seen. And so, Alan made a decision. He would return to the highway, this time not alone, but with a team equipped with cameras and recording devices. He needed answers, not just for his peace of mind but to prove to himself he wasn't crazy. The preparations were made, the team assembled, and as the sun set, they headed toward the highway, 
Unaware that some questions are better left unanswered, and some roads, better left untraveled. Continued from part one. As the sun dipped below the horizon, painting the sky with strokes of crimson and gold, Alan and his team assembled at the starting point of the infamous highway. The team consisted of MIA, an audio specialist known for her work on paranormal investigations, Derek, a skeptical scientist who specialized in debunking myths, and Rachel, a seasoned videographer who had captured some of the most haunted sites in the world on film. Equipped with night vision cameras, audio recording gear, and an array of sensors, the team's mood was a mix of excitement and apprehension. The air was brisk, the fading light casting long shadows that seemed to reach out towards the group. Alan briefed them on the plan, they would drive in a convoy of two cars, staying in constant communication via walkie-talkies. The journey began with a sense of eerie calm, the road ahead bathed in the glow of their headlights, the trees lining the path like silent sentinels. Alan led the convoy, his previous encounter fresh in his mind, the weight of fear and curiosity battling within him. Behind him, MIA monitored the audio equipment, the headphones capturing every nuance of the surrounding night. For the first hour, nothing unusual occurred. The only sounds were the normal creaks and groans of the woods, the wind rustling through the leaves, and the occasional crackle of the walkie-talkie confirming all was clear. But as they ventured deeper into the heart of the woods, the atmosphere changed. The air grew colder, denser, as if the night itself was pressing against them with unseen weight. Suddenly, MIA's voice crackled through the walkie-talkies, urgent and sharp. Stop the cars. I'm picking up something. Both vehicles pulled to a halt, the silence of the engine cut making the sudden drop in temperature more palpable. MIA stepped out, holding her audio device into the air, her expression tense. What is it? Derek asked, his voice a mix of skepticism and intrigue. It's a whispering? No, multiple whispers, just like Alan described. It's coming from all around us, MIA replied, her eyes wide as she tried to pinpoint the source. The team gathered around MIA, listening intently through the device. The whispers were low but distinct, an unintelligible cacophony that seemed to be carried on the wind itself. It was unlike any natural sound, and the lack of a clear source only heightened the group's unease. Rachel, ever the brave soul, suggested they set up cameras along the road. If there's something here, I want it on film, she declared, her voice firm. The team agreed, and they spent the next hour placing cameras at strategic points along the stretch of road where Alan had encountered the ghostly figure. As night deepened, a fog began to roll in, thick and suffocating, reducing visibility to a few feet in front of them. The team regrouped in the cars, monitoring the cameras from their laptops. It wasn't long before Rachel, reviewing the live feeds, gasped. There! On camera three, she exclaimed. Everyone crowded around her screen. There, illuminated by the infrared camera, was a figure standing by the side of the road. It was distant yet unmistakable, a woman, her outline blurred but her presence undeniable. The team was silent, each member processing the reality of the situation. Here was proof, undeniable proof, that something was on this road with them. The figure remained stationary, then, as if aware of being watched, it vanished from the frame. Derek, ever the skeptic, was the first to speak. There must be an explanation. It could be a trick of the light, fog, or a reflection. But Alan shook his head, his eyes fixed on the spot where the figure had stood. No, it's her. It's the same thing I saw. We need to go out there, see it up close. Against Derek's better judgment, the team armed themselves with flashlights and cameras and ventured into the fog. The woods seemed to close in around them, the whispering intensifying, as if the night had found its voice, many voices, whispering secrets meant only for the dark. As they approached the location where the figure had been seen, 
the temperature dropped sharply. Their breath became visible in the air, their flashlights beams struggling against the oppressive fog. Suddenly, MIA stopped, her audio equipment crackling with a surge of voices. This is it, she whispered, her voice trembling. They are all around us. The whispers grew louder, clearer, as if converging on the team. The words were still indistinct, but the tone was unmistakable, pleading, warning, threatening. The team huddled closer, their equipment recording every sound, every moment of this inexplicable encounter. Just then, a scream pierced the night, high and terrified. It was coming from back at the vehicles. Continued from part two, the scream shattered the eerie chorus of whispers like a stone through glass, sending a jolt of panic through the team. Without a second thought, they turned and ran towards the source of the scream, their flashlights bobbing wildly as they navigated through the dense fog and underbrush. As they reached the clearing where the vehicles were parked, they saw the fourth member of their team, Tom, who had stayed behind to monitor the equipment. He was on the ground, clutching his head in his hands, rocking back and forth in a state of absolute terror. His eyes were wide, unseeing, as if he had witnessed an unimaginable horror. What happened? Tom, talk to us. Alan demanded, kneeling beside him, trying to calm him down. Tom's words were a jumbled rush when he finally spoke. It, it was in the car with me. Just sitting there, staring, not saying a word, just staring with those, those eyes. His voice cracked, and he shuddered violently. The team exchanged worried glances. MIA checked Tom for injuries while Derek and Rachel searched the cars. There was no sign of anyone or anything unusual, but the temperature inside the vehicles was noticeably colder than outside. Deciding it was unsafe and unwise to remain there, Alan made the decision to move everyone back into the vehicles and drive a safe distance away to regroup and plan their next move. The fog seemed to press against them as they hastily packed up their equipment. The whispers now seemed to mock their retreat, rising and falling with the wind that shook the trees around them. Once they had driven several miles away from the spot, the atmosphere lightened slightly, the fog dissipating as they approached the edge of the forest. They stopped at a small, all-night diner on the outskirts of the nearest town to discuss their findings and check the recordings. Inside the diner, the harsh fluorescent lighting and the presence of a few late-night patrons provided a much-needed sense of normalcy. As they settled into a booth with cups of hot coffee, they reviewed the footage and audio recordings. The figure was clearly visible in several shots, ethereal and chilling. The audio captured the whispers, now clear enough to distinguish words, warnings, pleas for help, cries of anguish that sent chills down their spines. We need to go back, MIA stated firmly, her resolve hardened by the recordings. There's something there, something real, and it's suffering. Maybe we can help, maybe we can do something. Derek was skeptical, his scientific mind struggling to accept the inexplicable. And what if we can't? What if we're just, interfering with something we don't understand? Rachel, looking back over the footage, paused on a frame where the figure appeared closest. Whatever is happening, it's centered on that stretch of road. We have evidence now. We can bring in more help, more equipment. Alan, feeling responsible for initiating this terrifying journey, agreed. We'll prepare better. We'll get experts in this kind of phenomenon, bring in spiritualists, mediums, whoever can give us answers. The decision made, they spent the rest of the night making calls and arranging for reinforcements. By the time the sun rose, a plan was in place. They would return to the haunted highway, this time with a team equipped not just with cameras and recorders, but with individuals experienced in dealing with paranormal events. The next evening, as they drove back to the forest, the atmosphere was tense. The new members of the team brought an array of tools and knowledge, from thermal cameras to EMF meters, 
from historical records of the area to personal experiences with the supernatural. The original team shared their experiences, setting a grim tone for the night ahead. As they approached the same stretch of road, the darkness seemed to deepen, the trees leaning closer, as if aware of their return. The air grew cold, and once again, the fog began to roll in, thick and obscuring. They set up their base at the same clearing, this time with more powerful lights and a protective circle of salt, as suggested by one of the spiritualists. The equipment was turned on, the cameras rolling, the recorders capturing every sound as dusk turned to night. The whispers began almost immediately, the voices clearer than ever. The new team members listened intently, some of them speaking softly into the night, asking questions, pleading for responses. The atmosphere was electric, every shadow seemed to move, every sound a potential signal. Then, without warning, all the lights went out. A power failure, sudden and complete, plunging them into darkness. The night erupted with noise, shouts, the scrambling of feet, the distinct sound of something large moving through the underbrush. The team scrambled to restore light, their flashlights weak beams in the overwhelming darkness. As the emergency lights finally flickered on, they revealed a scene of chaos. Equipment was scattered, and one of the continued from part three, mediums, Esther, was standing at the edge of the circle, staring into the forest with a look of intense concentration and fear. Her hands were outstretched as if she was trying to push something away that only she could see. What is it, Esther? Alan hurried over to her, his voice laced with concern. She turned to look at him, her eyes wide with a mix of fear and fascination. It's here, she whispered hoarsely. The spirit, it's powerful, angry, trapped. It's all around us. Before Alan could respond, a sudden gust of wind swept through the clearing, the intensity forcing everyone to brace themselves. The trees swayed violently as if caught in a storm, leaves and small branches hurtling through the air. The whispers escalated into screams, a cacophony of voices that seemed to come from every direction, overwhelming the team with their intensity. Rachel and Derek scrambled to check the equipment, ensuring the cameras were still recording this extraordinary event. MIA, her audio gear at the ready, captured the eerie wails and the roaring wind, her face a mask of both terror and determination. As quickly as it had started, the wind died down, leaving a heavy silence in its wake. The team, shaken, gathered around Esther, who seemed to be the most directly affected by the encounter. We need to communicate with it, she said, her voice trembling but resolute. There's a story here, a terrible story of loss and anger. We need to help it find peace, or none of us will be safe. With renewed urgency, the team set up a seance right in the heart of the haunted highway. Candles were lit, forming a circle around Esther and the other mediums who had joined the investigation. Alan, Rachel, Derek, and MIA watched from just outside the circle, cameras focused on the mediums, capturing every moment. Esther began to speak, her voice soft but clear. We mean you no harm. We wish to understand your pain, to help you if we can. Her words seemed to echo in the still night air, hanging heavily around them. For a moment, nothing happened. Then, the candles flickered as though caught in a gentle breeze, and the temperature dropped sharply. The team's breath became visible, puffing out in white clouds as the cold enveloped them. A voice, different from the earlier whispers, clear and resonant, filled the air. Leave, you cannot help, too late. Esther continued, undeterred. Why is it too late? What happened to you? The voice, now tinged with sadness, replied, trapped, so long trapped, they didn't know, didn't see. As the spirit spoke, the mediums around Esther began to sway gently, as if in rhythm with unseen music. The air around the circle shimmered slightly, as if heat was rising from the ground, despite the cold. Who didn't see? 
Who trapped you? Esther asked, her tone gentle, coaxing. The voice grew louder, filled with a palpable sorrow. The night, the crash, so sudden, so quick. I waited, but they never came. Understanding dawned on the team. A tragic accident, a soul left behind, unseen and unheard, waiting for rescue that never came. The story was unfolding, a narrative of despair and solitude that had transformed into something vengeful and restless. We see you now. We hear you, Esther said soothingly. Tell us what you need to find peace. The spirit's response was a whisper, but clear in the silent night. Recognition, remembrance, release. Alan stepped forward, his voice firm yet compassionate. We will tell your story. You will be remembered. Let us help you move on. The spirit's presence seemed to gather strength, a palpable force in the center of the circle. Then, as if a pressure valve had been released, the air suddenly lightened, the temperature slowly rose, and the oppressive atmosphere began to dissipate. The candles in the circle flared brightly for a moment and then returned to a normal flicker. Esther slumped slightly, supported by the other mediums, her energy spent. The team was quiet, each member processing the night's events. They had come seeking ghosts and had found a soul in torment. Now, with the story revealed, they faced the task of honoring their promise to the spirit. As dawn approached, the team packed up their equipment, their conversations subdued. They knew this was only the beginning of a longer journey to document the story, to ensure it was told, and to seek out ways to officially commemorate the lost soul of the haunted highway. As they drove away from the site, the first light of day creeping over the horizon, a sense of cautious relief mixed with a deep, lingering unease. The road behind them was quiet, but the echoes of the night's revelations lingered, a continued from part four, reminder that the unknown still held many stories, waiting in the shadows. The drive back to civilization was quiet, each member of the team lost in their own thoughts, the weight of their experiences pressing heavily upon them. Back at their makeshift headquarters, a small rented office space in the nearest town, the team began the arduous task of reviewing all the footage and audio recordings collected during the night. The visual proof of the spectral figure and the clear audio of the spirit's voice were compelling, more intense than any evidence they had ever captured before. As they worked, the sun rose higher, casting long shadows across the room, a stark reminder of the contrast between day and night, between understanding and mystery. Despite the daylight, a sense of unease lingered with the team. The shadows seemed darker, the silence more oppressive. Alan, feeling a deep responsibility for the spirit they had encountered, took the lead in planning their next steps. We need to research the history of that stretch of road. There must be records of the accident, something that can tell us more about who the spirit was and what exactly happened. MIA, who had been quiet since their return, looked up from her laptop. I'll start with the local library. They might have old newspapers or public records. Anything that can give us more context. Derek, though still skeptical, couldn't deny the evidence. I'll check with the local police department. They might be reluctant to talk about it, but they could have reports on file. Rachel, who had been reviewing the video footage, paused a clip continued from part five, not noticed during their initial analysis. It was a dilapidated sign, partially obscured by overgrowth, but still legible, welcome to Old Mill Road. This clue sparked a realization in Alan. Old Mill Road was notorious in local law, a place rumored to have seen numerous tragic incidents over the decades due to its sharp turns and poor visibility. I've heard of that place, Alan murmured, it was eventually closed off after too many accidents, but it seems like the exact stretch where we found, her. With this new information, the team felt a renewed sense of purpose. They divided their efforts, with Rachel and Derek heading to the site to find more physical clues, while MIA and Alan focused on gathering historical data. 
As the day turned into evening, MIA returned from the library with news. She had found an old newspaper article about a tragic accident on Old Mill Road dating back over 30 years. It involved a young woman named Eliza Morris, who had disappeared after her car was found wrecked in the ditch. Her body was never recovered, and the case had eventually gone cold. This has to be her, MIA stated, her voice a mix of excitement and sorrow. Eliza Morris might be the spirit we've been communicating with. Armed with this information, the team planned their return to the haunted highway that night. They hoped to communicate with Eliza's spirit once more, this time to offer her closure and a chance to move on. The night was even darker than before, a new moon leaving the sky pitch black, the stars obscured by a creeping mist. They set up their equipment in the same spot, forming a circle with candles and placing Eliza's photograph, which they had obtained from the newspaper archives, in the center. Esther began the seance, calling out to Eliza. Eliza Morris, we know your story now. We've come to help you find peace, to help you cross over. The air grew thick, the temperature dropping so rapidly that their breath fogged in the air. The candles flickered as a soft whisper filled the circle. Thank you, the voice murmured, a sad, lilting tone that tugged at the heartstrings. Encouraged, Esther continued, Eliza, you are no longer forgotten. We remember you, and we will tell your story. You can rest now. As she spoke, a gentle wind began to swirl around the circle, the candles bending in the breeze but not extinguishing. The team held their breath, watching as a faint figure appeared within the circle, the ghostly image of a young woman, her expression one of sorrowful relief. The figure looked around, her eyes meeting each team member's gaze, a silent message of gratitude passing between them. Then, with a final, wispy sigh, the figure slowly dissipated, the wind dying down, the air warming slightly as if the cold had been a cloak that Eliza had finally shed. The team sat in stunned silence, each member processing the emotional farewell. They had set out to explore a haunted highway and had ended up giving a lost soul the peace she had been denied in life. As they began to pack up their equipment, feeling a mix of exhaustion and accomplishment, an eerie calm settled over Old Mill Road. The whispers that had once filled the air were gone, replaced by a tranquil silence that seemed to honor Eliza's departure. They left the site before dawn, the first hints of light painting the sky with colors of hope and renewal. The horror of the haunted highway had reached a resolution, but the experience had changed them, each member of the team feeling a deeper connection to the unseen world. As they drove away, the rising sun illuminated the road ahead, a symbol of the new day and the new stories waiting to be discovered, each with mysteries to solve and spirits to appease. Their journey had ended, but the road, as always, stretched onward.